Hey everybody, I had said that I didn't want to get into more Marilyn Manson Evan Rachel Wood commentary for reasons outlined in my video called Manson v. Wood, I'm Done. That said, I still feel like there are there are layers of subtlety and nuance to this case that are not being acknowledged or discussed by either side of the discussion, uh, which is shaping up to be people that are ride or die for Marilyn Manson and people that are ride or die for Evan Rachel Wood. I'm a fan of Marilyn Manson, and I am hoping that his version of events will prove to be true uh, when, uh, when addressed in a court of law. However, what I would like to do is reduce the level of mudslinging rate and raise the level of discussion and try to talk about some more subtle perspectives in all of this. And uh, especially, uh, especially because people on either side of this, uh, this discussion seem to be fixated on uh, tar, you know, fixated on painting Manson as either all good or all evil, when in reality the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle. So I want to talk about specific smaller issues that I don't feel are being addressed well. Uh, I want to say up front that, uh, where, as I mentioned in previous videos, wherever you stand on this issue, uh, it is important that we have sympathy for Evan Rachel Wood. And that is true even if you are a uh, hardcore Marilyn Manson fan. We need to have sympathy for Evan Rachel Wood because either she was abused and mistreated by Marilyn Manson, she was abused and mistreated by uh, Ilma Gore, or she was abused and mistreated by both of them. And so that is a very, very significant reality. We should acknowledge the importance of sympathy for Evan Rachel Wood. Now, I want to talk about specific issues, and the one I want to talk about uh, tonight is the Phoenix Act itself. By the way, when I was rehearsing making this video, I found myself stumbling over the Phoenix Act and saying the Patriot Act, just because it's a more commonly used similar sounding expression, so please forgive me if I make that mistake. But anyway, talking about the Phoenix Act, which is what Evan Rachel Wood, the legislation Evan Rachel Wood is pushing to have enacted nationwide, it's already been enacted in California. The purpose of this is to extend the time period within which survivors of domestic abuse have the right to, or have the capacity to um, press legal charges against their alleged abusers. This sort of legislation comes along periodically, and there's probably a better term for it, but I like to refer to it as therapy legislation. Um, or comfort legislation or something like that, because the argument always goes, this, this, act, this act of, um, or this crime was perpetuated against me. I did not act within the statute of limitations, so my, my ability to uh, legally confront my accuser has expired. However, I can sleep better at night knowing that uh, other people like me have a wider time frame within which to act. Uh, this sort of thing comes along periodically. Now, I want to emphasize uh, the standard disclaimers. I am not a lawyer. I am certainly not your lawyer. None of this should be construed as legal advice. The knowledge I have about how this works, I have some knowledge of police procedure and that sort of thing from having worked as a dispatch officer for two years. Um, so I was one of the people that if you called emergency, I answered and got you to police or fire or ambulance, uh, as the case would be as the case would have it. And in the course of that, I interacted with police officers every day. So it became, uh, I was able to get a better, more thorough understanding of why, of how police work and how police procedure works and that sort of thing. Again, like I said, I'm not a legal scholar. If you are a legal scholar and can elevate the discussion based on what I'm saying, or can elevate the discussion from what I'm saying, please feel free to comment below. Now, uh, the problem is, the problem with these kind of what I call therapy legislation things, where we want to expand the statute of limitations indefinitely, is that they ultimately work against the benefit of the people they are intended to help. Here's the thing. So the idea, the you know, bringing allegations, bringing, uh, I'm sorry, bringing, you know, pressing charges against somebody is not a victory in and of itself. Uh, it is the that person that you accuse of a crime is uh, innocent until proven guilty. 
if you are somebody on the radical lunatic fringe, and I'm sorry to call it that, but that's what it is, if you are somebody on any extraction of the radical lunatic fringe who thinks that innocent until proven guilty is, a, uh, is some sort of act of oppression that must be struck down, I strongly, strongly suggest that you actually look into why that, is, that, why that assertion forms the basis for our laws and legal practices. Anyway, uh, but because the person in question is innocent until proven guilty, uh, being uh, accusing them, uh, I'm sorry, accusing them and bringing uh, formal charges against them is only the beginning of the process. You haven't accomplished anything. They are still innocent of the crimes of which you are, you have, uh, you, they have been accused until a case is proven in a court of law against them. And that case has to be proven, and it is Im vitally important in the service of justice that that case be proven in a timely manner. So, I give you, to give you a historical example of what I call therapy legislation would be the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Lilly Ledbetter, God, it's hard to say. <laughs> Lilly Ledbetter was a woman who worked for an industrial manufacturing interest at the managerial level for a number of years, ultimately learned that uh, she had been getting uh, paid, uh, she was being paid a, a, an order, uh, a significant amount less than the men who, the other managers at her level, all of which were men, all of which were getting paid more. Now, to be very clear, it is not that they were getting paid one amount and she was getting paid another amount. There was a, um, there was a range of amounts that people were getting paid, and she happened to be at the bottom of that, uh, the bottom of that range of um, of wages. Anyway, so uh, she alleged that this was the result of ge of gender discrimination, and so she uh, she pushed for the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which would allow people to bring charges of gender discrimination at any point. It expands the statute of limitations indefinitely so that people can uh, bring charges of pay discrimination based on gender indefinitely. Now, the problem is just because you've accused someone of paying you incorrectly on the basis of your gender does not mean that they are automatically guilty of it. That still has to be proven in a court of law. And at the time, the statute of limitations was very narrow for uh, accusing people, or for not accusing, for bringing, uh, bringing these, uh, these charges before a judge. Uh, bringing formal charges in these cases, I believe it was six months. It was very narrow. Uh, Lily Ledbetter argued that she had been getting paid incorrectly for decades and didn't know about it until she retired, until she was ready to retire. <clears throat> but at the same time, she also said that she knew about uh, she knew about examples of uh, gender discrimination that were perpetuated against her that had the result of her, that resulted in her not being paid correctly that she knew about for decades and de uh, for decades on end. So <clears throat> she has talked outside, out both sides of her mouth on this matter. I want to be very clear to people for whom uh, ge the uh, gender, you know, for, for whom gender issues in, in the uh, working world are an issue and something that you're passionate about, I am not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that you ought not to be paid uh, what your work is worth based on your gender. I'm not suggesting you be discriminated against that way at all. What I am saying is that the act, the legislation that she pushed through, uh, ultimately works to hurt people at uh, works to hurt people who are trying to bring this before the bar of law. Okay, so the uh, what she said was that she had all of these examples of uh, gender discrimination that went back to early in her career that resulted in her, the long-term effect of her not being able, of her not making as much money as the other managers at her level. Well, the problem with that is that when you've set you've set it up in such a way that uh, people can operate within a decades-long time frame of bringing justice, well, you know what happens. It is exactly what happened to Lily Ledbetter, which is uh, all of those people, the people who could have corroborated her stories about what happened decades ago when she, uh, when she was earlier in her career, all of the people who could have corroborated that had moved on, had become inaccessible. The people who were, she was alleging, were directly responsible for that had not been with the company for decades. One of them was even had even passed away at that point. 
And so all of the all of the evidence, all of the corroborating witnesses and information were no longer available to her. And no amount of expansion of the <clears throat> statute of limitations is going to benef is going to benefit that. See, the thing is, you have to understand about uh, witnesses, about people with evidence, about all of that. Evidence expires, it gets lost over time, it has to be collected as soon as possible. And similarly, uh, the people, the witnesses that corroborate your story have to be gotten on record as soon as possible because here's the thing. Uh, witnesses, even the ones that are you know totally on your side and ready to help you, they don't wait around forever. They're not sitting there by the phone with a stack of, you know, manila folders full of evidence waiting for you to call so that they can help your case. They move on with their lives. They become inaccessible. They die. They uh, forget things. They move, uh, they forget things. They have a change of heart about wanting to be involved. All of these things happen and you have to act as soon as possible. And so what Lily, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act does is it creates this false assumption that you're going to be able to get justice down the line if, uh, you know, if, you bring, if you bring these allegations way, way, way down the line at the end of your career. Also, unfortunately, it encourages people to game the system. It encourages people to say, uh, it encourages people to, to uh, find out about some, some gender uh, pay discrimination, formulate a case against it, and then uh, sit on it for as long for an extended period of time, so that they can rake in a massive, you know, potentially rake in massive, um, a massive cash payout in terms of compensation, additional damages and compensation, and all of that. So it encourages people to game the system. Now, to be very clear, because there will be people who will jump on this and say, so you're saying that all women, no, I'm not saying all women, I'm not saying all people in general. I, most, most people will act, uh, will do well and they will act uh, ethically, but there are people out there who will manipulate the system. And that, that kind of legislation only uh, enables them to uh, manipulate it more. Part of the reason we have statutes of limitation in place is so that they don't manipulate the system, or is to discourage manipulation of the system. Anyway, so let's bring this around to the Phoenix Act. Uh, by the same token, if you are a survivor of domestic abuse, the number one form of evidence is forensic evidence, and it has a very, very, very short shelf life. Forensic evidence can be everything from, you know, if you have a bruise that the forensic team can demonstrate matches uh, the shape of somebody's knuckles, you know, so it was clearly done with a fist of a certain size, and then the person that hit you has swollen, bruised, inflamed knuckles. That's going to, that is tremendously important forensic evidence that can corroborate your story. Similarly, if you're sexually assaulted, uh, if you are sexually assaulted, you should not even, uh, I've been told you should not even uh, use the bathroom before going to the police. No matter how bad you have to go, get to the police immediately. Because if you, um, if you use the bathroom, it can invalidate the DNA evidence and the forensic evidence that's been left behind. So, um, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be, uh, to be perfectly, to be perfectly crass about it, if there is semen that has been left, left behind and you urinate, you can void, uh, you can, uh, void the remnants of the semen. If you, um, if you should void your bowels and you have a, uh, you, you know, you take a big, Again, sorry to be graphic, if you take a big, painful, bloody crap, well, that's going to, uh, that's also not going to help the forensics team because if you've been uh, anally penetrated against your will, they're going to be looking for things like uh, tears and fissures in the rectal lining that will uh, corroborate your story. And if, and oh no, you had a big, bloody crap, well, now you, they can say, well, some of that may have occurred as a result of that. I know that's gross, but I'm making a very important point. The evidence has to be. Uh, collected and uh, and stored, collected, documented, and stored as soon as possible. Three years later, which is the you know that's that's what it originally was in uh, California. That uh, that's what the statute of limitations was in California. That has now been expanded to five years. 
Um, Evan, uh, Evan Rachel Wood uh, claims that people need between seven and 10 years to know they've been abused. By the way, I find that extraordinarily insulting, and I don't say that lightly. As a survivor of abuse myself, I certainly did not need seven, or ten, seven to 10 years to figure out that I've been abused. I knew I was being abused when it happened. I may not have known how to deal with it. I may not have known the right course of action, but I knew it was abuse. Anyway, the, um, the, the, uh, the point being, by expanding that window of time, uh, let's say it's three years, let's say, or it's three years now, let's say it gets expanded to five years, like in California, there is no forensic, new forensic evidence you're going to be able to accumulate uh, and document five, uh, three years after the fact. There will be no uh, forensic evidence five years after the fact, seven years, 10 years. The number one thing, forensic evidence, the number one thing that determines the guilt of the guilty and the innocence of the wrongly accused that number one factor will not be available to you. It really will not be available. It, uh, it likely will not even be available to you uh, within a week of the incident in question. You have got to collect it immediately. It's the number one thing that validates your story. Uh, the Phoenix Act does absolutely nothing to address that. None whatsoever. And then the, uh, and, uh, and so again, that is the most important thing. By creating, by expanding the statute of limitations indefinitely, you are creating a false sense of t uh, a false sense of a time frame that does not exist. The clock is ticking instantly. As soon as it happens, you have got to act. And I know it's scary to act. I know it's scary. I know it's terrifying. It's confusing. It's not always clear what you should do. But you need to, uh, the thing you need to know is that you need to act as soon as it happens. Um, so that's, uh, and, and that is crucially important. Now, the next thing, the next thing is, let's say that you do bring uh, charges against someone three years later or five years, seven years, ten years down the line. Okay, if you, if this, uh, one of the things, let's say even under those circumstances, you are able to prove abuse uh, by per, uh, perpetuated by that person. Let's say you are able to prove that the uh, the fact that you have not, if you have not interacted with this person in three years, five years, whatever, the longer amount of time that goes by with you not having interacted with this person, the judge has to take that into consideration with sentencing guidelines. So if it has been, if you know, if you were, say, beaten up by your spouse or beaten up by your, your boyfriend or your intimate partner, you left them, and then five years after the fact, you want to bring a, uh, you want to bring charges against them, the judge is going to look at that and say, well, if you have not had, if you, if, if this person has not been a problem in your life for five years since this incident happened, then the likelihood that they will reoffend is extraordinarily low. So they have, uh, they have to factor that into consideration. So it diminishes the degree of punishment that the person may receive. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on sentencing guidelines, but it's, uh, it could, um, it, it seems like if I understand correctly, your accusations, the further out they go, the less like the less of an immediate threat they are, the further out they go, the lo more likely it is that it gets busted down to a misdemeanor at best. And um, so it, it diminishes the degree of punishment that can be properly meted out uh, to the uh, eventually convicted person. So that's another example. But another thing that Evan Rachel Wood is saying that is very, very wrong is she's been saying in the media, now again, I've not seen the Phoenix Rising documentary because I don't currently have uh, HBO Max, and like I've said before, I don't want to sign up for HBO Max only to, uh, and then go watch the Phoenix Rising documentary because I don't want to give them the impression that, I don't want to contribute to them getting the impression that this is the sort of thing that gets them clicks and will contribute them to them doing these one-sided inflammatory documentaries again in the future. So, um, anyway, but the problem is Evan Rachel Wood, I know she has said in press interviews and that sort of thing, that when you are escape, when you're in the process of escaping an abusive situation, 
Uh, you're not thinking about bringing charges. You're thinking about just surviving. Okay, that is absolutely the wrong information to be giving people who are escaping abusive situations. If you are escaping an abusive situation with a menacing partner that is going, that has been abusing you, has been mistreating you, has been a very real physical uh, threat to you and your well-being, you should not be doing that on your own. You should have the police involved. Don't try to be dealing with, don't try to be escaping from a, an abusive situation uh, on your own by yourself without the police involved. Go to the police, get a temporary protective order put in place. Um, and and if you have had if you have had any degree of abusive encounter with a person within uh, a within a short time frame, it again it's another thing that varies, but uh, you know it can be say a matter of a few months or a few weeks. But if you have been immediately harmed with, by someone, uh, get out of that situation. Go to the police immediately and uh, request a. Um, request a temporary protective order they will take you through that process in fact if it is uh if it is um uh something where you are reporting it the day that it happened uh they may even take the person in question into custody while they get that temporary protective order uh handed down uh you know handed down and served to the person now that temporary protective order is incredibly important because if you are dealing with a menacing sociopathic psychopathic person that has no regard for the law then they and they come after you again they immediately violate the temporary protective order that's aggravated stalking now they go to jail now you're really protected from them um they they go to jail and they they can still be held uh, they, they can still be uh, charged with the crime of aggravated stalking, even if the abuse uh, allegations don't eventually hold up in court. So you, you, they will, the, it is set up so that if you get yourself out of this situation and go directly to the police, they can help you. They will help you. And everything Evan Rachel Wood is doing is working against that. She is pushing for a fantasy, this, this borderline fantasy scenario where you are going to escape from abuse, uh, uh, escape from a, you're somehow going to escape from a level of abuse that is so violent and so, um, that is so violent, that is as violent and heinous as what she's alleging, alleging that Marilyn Manson did, that you're going to escape from that. And 10 years will go by without you having any contact, with significant contact with this person whatsoever. 10 years will go by, and then you will be able to bring this uh, court, this bring these allegations before a judge and have this play out in your favor. The more time you waste, the, the more time you waste, the less action you take in the immediate moment, the worse. The, the, the worse the outcome for you, the victim. And Evan Rachel Wood is trying to push exactly that. And that's why I have a problem with, and I, I, hope, it, I hope it comes across to people, that that is one of the reasons I have a problem with this kind of feel-good legislation, as I call it, or therapy legislation. Because the, this whole thing of I want to expand the statute of limitations so that people like me have this wider time frame within, within which to act. You're not helping people when you do that. You're giving them misinformation. They need to know what they need to do, what they need to do immediately when the situation occurs. They need to know. Uh, they need to know what kind of evidence they need to uh, to have and ac accumulate against a person, and they need to know the the most ap the most applicable <laughs> applicable time frame with which it, within which to act. This is crucially important, vital information for someone that is fleeing from abuse. And like I said, the police, uh, the idea, the idea that you escape from abuse, and um, the idea that you escape from your from abuse all on your own without police involvement whatsoever, uh, the person remains, the person is not involved in your life for ten years, and then you are going to somehow collect evidence against them at that point and uh, bring charges against them is fallacious. It is absurd in the extreme. Now, don't get me wrong. Different crimes have different uh, windows of statutes of limitations, and there are reasons for that. Um, you know, and murder, for example, has no statute of limitations. 
but uh, there are other crimes that have a wider range of win uh, high, a wider window within which to act. Uh, they're based on, for example, uh, how long it may take the police to do their job or to pursue to collect enough evidence that sort of thing. There are different factors for different crimes. But one of the things, it's like we live in a world where absolutely nobody believes that any facet of the, uh, they, they don't believe that any facet of the country in which they live is designed to benefit them. That's the message that the left and the right gives to everybody is uh, the world hates you. You're completely fucked. There's nothing you can do about it. Only our sweeping legislation can save the day. But believe it or not, these things are structured with the interest uh, with the interests of the two parties involved in mind. The uh, it's structured with the interest of the accused in mind, so that they are uh, they are not subjected to uh, perpetual. They are not um, they are not sub sub subjected to a state of perpetual accusation or ongoing accusation. And it is and it is also structured with the. Um, the potential victim in mind so that they can be aided and assisted as soon as possible. And that is the crucial thing. That is, that is the real, that's the real bullshit that Evan Rachel Wood is pushing. The idea that you don't know you're being abused, you don't figure it out until you've already gotten out of the situation, that, and then that 10 years later you realize that justice needs to be done. This is insane, or insane as a value judgment. This is ridiculous. It's absurd. It's absolutely asinine. I know those were all value judgments too, but I'm saying ins insane is, is, not help is a word that's not helping. It's ridiculous. It is uh, this, uh, the Phoenix, what the Phoenix Act proposes to do does not benefit survivors. It, uh, it, only, it only allows for the case to go stale. So those are my thoughts on the matter. That's, those are my thoughts on the Phoenix Act. Hopefully I've made some sense. Please let me know what you think in the, uh, in the comments. And if you are someone who disagrees with what I had to say, please understand that I uh, please respect that I uh, I don't need to hear a bunch of dismissive nonsense of oh whatever you uh, oh whatever you clearly just hate X group of people that's why you're taking Y position because you really think Z and you don't want to be honest about it don't waste your time or mine with that I just told you what I actually believe discuss.